Welcome to the bin picking instructional series with the, the FANUC IR Vision 3D Area Sensor. In this video, we will cover the complete setup in RoboGuide from start to finish with the, installing a robot, the bin, the parts, setting up all the frames, setting up the area sensor, programming vision, and then running a teach bin and program to pick parts. So this is going to be a very long video. We're probably going to shoot for an hour. Um, make sure you have enough time to watch it. And um, also, this video is going to cover some very advanced topics, so it, and it will not explain all of these. So you might want to make sure that you're up to date on everything. Um, first off, to use bin picking in RoboGuide, you must have the bin pick plugin installed as well as the Vision Setup plugin. To do this, and if you don't already have it, you have to reinstall RoboGuide. Um, when you're doing so, make sure you're installing RoboGuide Revision J or greater. And um, as you go through the install wizard, when you get to the plugin window, which you can see below, uh, make sure that you select bin pick and vision setup. Um, we can see bin picking right here. We can see vision setup down here. What that does for you is um, that allows you to now add an area sensor to RoboGuide. Then the next thing is we have to do is start our robot. And this is the part where I'm starting assuming you know certain things. You have to be able to set up your own robot in RoboGuide. Uh, the one thing you will have to select is software option J909, which is IR vision bin picking. And you have to set your DRAM to 128 megabytes. And you also have to enable your vision simulation once you have created the robot, and of course you should be using handling tool. If you're doing this on a real robot, what the software option J909 will do for you when you're purchasing a robot is you'll get the projector, the cameras, all the cables you'll need, the digital multiplex of the camera control unit or the CCU, um, all internal cables required to connect everything to the controller. You'll get a different kind of main board, one that has force sensing and 3D area sensor enabled. And you get the high-speed CPU with the 128 megabytes of DRAM. Also, you'll get the software package, which includes the 2D IR vision package and the 3D area sensor vision package, along with um, critical software for bin picking. That is the interference avoidance, partless manager, and some TP program macros to get everything going. So let's get started. I, uh, I have already created my robot in RoboGuide, and um, if we go into our robot and go to Serialize, come on back. Here we go. So in our software version, application is handling tool. I use an LRMate 200 ID 7L. I uh, don't have motion groups. And in here, you'll notice I have my IR Vision bin picking, option J909. That's the one you want. You can, everything else, leave it at default. You'll be fine. If you want to add extra options, be my guest. Then in the advanced tab over here, this is the critical part. You want 128 megabytes of DRAM. That's the one you need. And then we're going to hit Next. And um, since I apparently forgot to do this, we're going to have to let our robot reboot here real quick. Apply. Confirm the reserialization. Your virtual robot controller will reboot. And the next time you boot up, everything should be fine. And there we go. So now the next thing you want to do is you want to go to your cell browser over here. And you want to find the robot controllers. And 
your robot controller for the robot you're attaching your projector to, or your 3D area sensor to, and at the bottom you'll find something called vision. You want to right click this and you want to click enable vision simulation. This will let the RoboGuide in a simulate vision as if it were real. And to do this again, you have to reboot your controller. So we're going to hit OK. And while that is doing that, we'll continue over here. So the next thing we got to do is we got to have, we got to add a part. We got to add our bin. That is something else that you get when you install the bin pick plugin. You get actual containers. Um, we can generate random part positions. We're going to have to add some tooling, uh, user frame, and some tool frames. Um, I'm assuming everybody knows how to use user frames and tool frames. The thing we're going to cover here mostly is the orientation, because that is actually very critical for bin picking, that your frames are set up correctly. So to do that, let's see. All right, we rebooted already. Good. So first things first, um, I'm going to have to shift my robot up a little bit. I'm going to add a few things. This is going to go pretty quick. We're going to add an obstacle. Not from the CAD library. We're going to add a single CAD file. And there's my structure. And um, we're going to put that at 0, or actually more like 500. And um, then we have this at 90. And down here at 90. There we go. Now oh, that looks good. Um, so that's our structure. I think I spelled it right. There we go. So that's there. The next thing we want is our part. For this one, we're just going to do a very simple box. We're going to call this box. And it uh, doesn't matter, really, if you set a weight right here. The important bits are that we do a 40 by 40 by 40 millimeter part for now. Hit apply. OK. Now that we have that, the next thing we want is we're going to go to fixtures over here. Add a fixture. And at the bottom here, you'll notice a new item. If you used RoboGuide before, which I'm assuming you did, there's a new thing called a container. So what that does, it adds an actual box where you can put stuff in. So this is different compared to previous stations um, that you can, as in that it actually open at the top. You can see, you can go, you can look into it. Um, so that's very nice. And then uh, let's put this in the right spot real quick. Let's see, where did this go? At 0, 4, 30, 2, and at um, 6.51. And then that's all zeros. And we have a size of 550, 380, and 150. Apply. Very nice. So now we have our little bin down here. The next thing you want to do is you want to go to your Parts tab, select the box, hit Apply. You can see it appears down here like it would normally. The next thing, though, and this is the cool part about, bin, about the bin picking set up in RoboGuide is we can generate random parts. So if you click Add, you get your normal two options, which is Array and Import Part Data Offset, or Part Offset Data. And this really doesn't help us for bin picking because it's not random, it's structured. Or you can randomize it a little bit, but not to the degree we want. So what you want to do is click bin picking, and all you get is this button called Create Bulk. When you click this, another window will pop up. This will take a second because it's a full physics engine. And um, you can play with some settings down here. But in essence, all it does, it tumbles parts into your bin randomly. See, now we have a very nice random generated pile of parts. They settle. They use physics. They tumble. There we go. Look at that. Very nice. And then all you have to do is hit OK and hit OK, and they get populated into your bin. And now we have a bin full of random parts. And the nice thing is you can see over here all of these parts exist. And each one you can see over here has a very random and unique offset. And of course, you could do this by hand if you wanted to. 
but I am pretty sure you would be busy all day. So that's there. Um, if you go to simulation, you'll know this, that you'll, uh, actually, that's interesting. Why is that not enabled? It should be allowed to pick. Okay, we'll get back to that in a minute. All right, so now we have our parts. Next thing we want to do is we want to add our tooling. Again, this is, some, this is something that you should be familiar with how to do. We're going to go into general, um, throw in my tooling, CAD. There we go. It has a position of, oh, where did I put it? Um, 90 and minus 90. There we go. Nice and straight. So that's there. Then we want to go to our U-Tool, edit the U-Tool, which is at 163. So this is an important part. This is where you need to pay attention. Notice how by default the z-axis points out of the tool. It goes this way. We don't want that. We want our z-axis to point into the tool. I don't care where your x and y's point as long as your z-axis points into your tool. That is important for bin picking to work properly later on with all our interference avoidance and all that stuff. So make sure your z-axis points into your tool. And then the next thing is we want to add our box to the gripper, edit our offset. Oh, what, did I, what is it at? Um, uh, again, at 163. Whoops. And um, I think that's right. And then, really? Did I? Oh, I, I slipped. My bad. There we go. Much better. Almost correct. I think we have to add a little bit of rotation here, and we're square. All right, that should be very um, um, familiar to you, and um, that sets up the tool frame. Again, the important part being your z-axis points into your tool. Some of you might be doing that already. Some of you might have the convention of having the z-axis pointing out of your tool. For this, unfortunately, to make it work properly, you have to point it into the tool. All right, then the next thing we want to set up, and the last thing before we go to the next section, um, unless I forgot something, is uh, we want to set up our user frame. So it is recommended that for bin picking, you use your user frame. Of course, you can do everything in world if you choose. Um, but using a user frame makes your life significantly easier as the person that is programming this. So I highly recommend you do so. Um, for this one, we're going to take user frame one. You can use whichever user frame you would like, but we're going to use user frame one. And because we're in RoboGuide and it's nice and easy, we can attach this to our fixture. Apply. All right, there we go. Um, then we want to edit our user frame. and. Um, Let's see, did I write this down? Probably not. So what are we at? We got, um, oh, what is the bin size? So we're at minus 190? Nope, wrong way. OK, so this goes right there. And then. Uh, there we go. That looks better. This one goes to two seventy five. Whoops, not that much. And uh, apparently also positive. Apply. All right. Now it's sitting right here, and uh, you're you can see where I'm going with this. We're going. Whoops, and this is at 150 height. There we go. Now it's to the corner. And just to make this a little bit nicer, there we go. So now you can see that my x direction points in one side of the bin, my y direction along the other side, my z, again, I don't care which way you point your x and y as long as your z points up. And um, it's attached to the corner. So that'll make numbers later on much easier to understand and see what they mean. 
Um, in, I know that in real life this is not exactly possible, especially since your bin is not always going to be in the same spot. So something that might be helpful when you're designing your system is to put a little structure right next to it that will have the same height as the top of your bin, and you can teach your user frame to that, and that way you'll always have it in the same spot, even if your bins are not. But again, it doesn't really matter where you teach it as long as your Z points up and out of your bin. All right, so that completes this bit. And uh, let's go back to here. See that we, uh, we got the part, the bin, the random positions, tooling, user frame, and tool frame. All right. So now comes the fun part. We want to add our projector. I'll show you what sensor definition files are and quickly cover again what the difference between a sensor unit and a camera and a or a s the actual sensor is. Um, show you how to connect virtual cameras, how you check your field of view, and then how you can calibrate them in RoboGuide and also mention how you should do it in the real world. So again, that brings us back to here. First things first, we enabled our vision simulation. Um, so now what we can do is we go down here to sensor unit, right click, add vision sensor unit. And you can add this bit by bit. You can go to add projector, CAD library, and you'll see that all the projectors show up. And um, you can also see that there's a couple that show up with already a camera attached. So the other way you get to this, by the way, is you go to sensor definition file. It should bring you to the default location where these should be. Nope. There we go. And we're going to select area sensor setup normal def. Does a bunch of calculations. And bam. There we go. Got our projector. We got our two cameras. Everything is good. Now, this isn't exactly in the right spot yet. And um, I want to show you something else real quick. I mentioned something about a sensor unit and the projector. So if you go down here in your, in your cell browser, you hit this. Notice how there's a sensor unit, and that contains your projector, your camera, and your camera too. Now, if I select, so if you're in here and you want to move your stuff around, and you just click the projector, and you drag this. It doesn't take the cameras with it. And you notice that it's all relative to this little tiny dot that's floating around here. That is your sensor unit. These are not. These are part of your sensor unit. And if you want to move everything as a group, you have to select the sensor unit. And now you can see everything comes along when you move it. So be aware of that when you move this around. Um, you're, better off, you're better off selecting this in your cell browser not renaming it, selecting it, and then you can drag it around nicely. So let's put this guy back to where he belongs real quick. Very nice. And um, because I've done this before and I already measured everything, I can adjust my camera positions here. There we go. Notice that these are all relative to the camera unit, not the robot. The camera unit, the, not the camera unit. These are all relative to the sensor unit, and the sensor unit is relative to the robot. So what I'm doing right now is essentially just setting them up, and then I can drag the whole thing around, and they'll stay in nice and neat formation, and um, everything's good. Also, I want you to notice that it looks like they're unevenly spaced. So this camera is much closer to the projector than this camera is. But the critical part, actually, is, is that the cameras are evenly spaced away from the projector lens. That's the important part. The housing doesn't matter. The projector lens has to have even spacing, or should have ev even spacing between the cameras. If you're not perfectly centered, that's fine. Um, you'll, you might lose a little field of view, but in general, you should be OK. So let's put this in the right spot here real quick. Come on. How is that so difficult? There we go. All right, so I know that mine goes to 0, 430, 1800, 0, 0, Snaps right to where it's supposed to go. And you can see it's nicely attached. And 
pretty well centered on top of my bin here. All right. Now, if you're doing this and you haven't set it up like I have previously, um, a nice way to do this is you double click your projector. Now it's, you go to your view and you select visible always. Hit apply and maybe you want to do this one. And now you can see quite nicely the size of projection from your projector. And you want to make sure your entire bin is inside of that field of view. Similarly, you want to do this with your cameras. And um, by the way, they come with a standard height of 400. Um, you might want to increase that to a little bit more. I think I'm going to go with 2,000 here. And we're going to say this is visible always, apply. And you can see that my camera also covers the, sees the whole bin. And another way to verify this is if you go to your cell browser, right click, camera view, you can actually see what the camera is seeing. Now here's a critical part. Each camera has to be able to see the whole bottom of the bin. Because the way the projector work, uh, the sensor works, it only generates data where both cameras can see. So if your camera sits further outside and you don't see a bit down here because of this wall, you're not going to get data. And you can have parts on there and you'll never see them. So that's something to keep in mind. You want to have your cameras as far apart as possible while still inside the bin. All right, that bit, let's disable this guy again. And we're going to make him visible only when snap is done so we can see it later. All right. So that's that. Um, yeah, let's, did we cover everything for this portion? Oh, connecting, right. So now that you have it, that's all great. Doesn't connect it to the robot. So next thing is you go to back to your vision, and you go to vision properties. And you should get this little window. And you have four tabs up top, and we're interested in the general tab. First thing first, we have digital cameras, so we're going to say we want digital, apply, yes. We get one port. In this port, you have to select the digital multiplexer, apply. Now you get four ports, and now you can apply the first camera. And by the way, you always have to hit apply after you do it, and notice how this one's not possible because it's already connected once. And you have to hit apply. Now the cameras are connected. Great. Next thing is we go to the projector tab. Notice you get four projectors because that's the maximum number of projectors you can daisy chain. And we select our projector, hit apply, and now everything is connected to the virtual robot. Now, in RoboGuide, this is fantastic because it makes the hardest part of the whole thing a lot easier. You just double click your cameras, go to cam calib calibration tab here, and you just hit generate camera calibration. We want to for RoboGuide, it doesn't matter. If you were to ex export this to a real wo robot, I would recommend you use the robot-generated grid calibration. We're calling this Cal1, associating this with Camera1, and this is going to be relative to user frame 1. OK. Camera calibration was generated. Now, it wasn't that easy, if it only were so easy in the real world. So now we're at Camera2. Do the same thing. Robot-generated grid calibration, Cal2. Cam 2 for a robot and user frame 1. OK. OK. And that handles that. Now our cameras are calibrated. Um, if you do this in the real world, you should use robot generated grid calibration. And uh, I'm going to have to defer you to the manual for that one because that is a bit more extensive and we're not going to cover this in the video. But the robot generated grid calibration works much better much, much better with cameras that are at an angle like this and potentially high up, and you have a large field of view. And you possibly have some obstructions, so you can't really put down a grid reliably. So this, in, for a setup like this, robot-generated grid calibration is the way to go. And as a side note, if you ever have the choice between a grid calibration and a robot-generated grid calibration, go with the robot-generated grid calibration. It works much better. It might be a little bit more tedious to set up, but once you have it set up, it is far superior to the regular calibration. All right, that's done. I think we did it everything. Yep, all right. 
Next step. Now comes the fun part. Now we get to set up our 3D area sensor and its data acquisition. And then I'm going to show you some differences because this is a simulated, a simulated world, never, as, never the same as the, uh, the real world. The simulated world's ideal. The real world is far from it. So that guy. Now you can access your robot controller, uh, your, your robot controller through the web browser by going into your robot and selecting web browser or default browser. Don't do that. There is, there is some instability with this controls when you do it this way. And it has something to do with how this is routed. Don't ask me to explain it. I can't. Um, but what you do is you go to Internet Explorer. And um, what we're going to do here, for starters, is we're going to go for next, we're going to go to Computer, right click, and go to Properties. And down here, you'll find your computer name. You want your computer name, mine's some weird number, and you want to put that into your bar up there, and we're going to go to mine. You can see I have the computer, and then I have my port specified as well, so colon 9000, and that'll bring up your robot homepage. If you do this, that'll work around some of the instability of this controls when connecting to a virtual robot. Of course, if you really want to, you can do it through here, but that's a little bit more unstable, and you'll have to restart a couple of times, and it might get hung up a couple of times. So I really don't recommend it. Um, this page should be familiar to most of you, or all of you actually, with the difference that now there's an interference avoidance setup and a partless manager setup. These are new, and we'll get to that later. But we're going to go to vision setup first. Let's minimize this guy again. And first thing you'll notice is hey, our cameras appeared. And notice they're commented to be auto generated by RoboGuide. Also, if you go to camera calibrations, we got calibrations auto-generated by RoboGuide and everything. And if you were to export to the real world, you would have to reteach the GPM and all that stuff. Um, but for now, they're good. And what we want to do is we're going to go to V-Type and Vision Process Tools. Here is where the fun begins. We want to go to Create, the drop-down menu, and now you have 3D Area Sensor and 3D Area Sensor Vision Process. This is your sensor process. This generates your 3D point cloud. This down here finds your parts. So if you're paying attention, that implies that there's two separate steps to this. It's not like with normal 2D vision where you just do a snap and find and everything's done. You have to acquire a 3D point cloud first, and then you have to do your snap and find. So we're going to create a 3D area sensor. We're going to call this guy. Uh, we're going to call him area underscore sensor. By the way, keep this simple. You're going to have to type it out in the teach pen and program later, so don't call it zone 5 robot 3 deeper 16. Who cares? Call it area sensor. All right. You'll get this little thing. Um, you get this little symbol on the side. This is supposed to represent the line pattern of the area sensor. And if we double click this, you'll see this window. Here, you should see up here your cell browser. Uh, your, your vision tree, and this is your main pet setup page. But the first thing you're going to do, and this is where it already starts to differ from the real world, um, your projector ID is by default 1. And if you only have one projector attached, you leave it at 1. Otherwise, this refers to the position of the projector in the daisy chain. In the real world, this will not say OK. You will have to hit the Start button. You'll see your projector flash a series of images, and this will turn to OK if you have everything connected properly. In the virtual world, everything is connected properly. You can still hit the button if you want. Nothing will happen. Um, then it'll tell you, once you hit this, and once you get the, the check I.O. OK, you get your projector type, and you get your projector version. This should be at 1.5 or greater. If you have 1.3 or 1.2, please contact FANUC. Um, the next thing is you have an intensity, and you have an exposure time, and you have a map density. And then you have a standard z-height. For now, we're just going to call that 0. And in general, you can probably just call it 0. Notice how you don't get to choose your application frame. It'll pull that from the camera calibrations in a minute. And then you have your test pro projector pattern. So remember how we had this in here where we 
we turned on the field of view in here and we centered our projector over the bin. In the real world, when you do this, you get you don't get to do this so nice and easy like we did by just turning it on and dragging it around. You get a button down here that's called projector on. And when you click that, it turns on the projector, obviously, and there's a test projector pattern. And you can project either a full white or, well, green, since the light is green, um, a striping pattern, which is the final striping pattern that the projector projects, a frame or a checkerboard. When you select this and you hit this projector on button that we don't have in the virtual world, it projects this and that helps you center your projector over your bin and make sure everything is properly aligned in your field of view. Um, and then we did got a display mode of grayscale or color and I'll show you that in a minute once we have everything. Um, so we're going to go up here into the, the, the cell, the vision tree and we're going to select camera view, camera view one and all you do is you select your first calibration and you select your second calibration. Notice how this shows you the image of the camera. If you go into your 3D area sensor, you hit acquire 3D map, you get a point cloud. If this point cloud, because you're in a real world, doesn't look the way you want to, after you hit the acquire 3D map, you just go to your camera view, and you should be able to see the striping pattern. In the virtual world, we don't see that. So if we're here, it's a mute point. But if you do this in the real world, you can see your striping pattern. You can now um, identify if they're too bright, if you have reflections, if they're too dark, if your parts are too dull and you need more intensity and all that stuff. So this is a really helpful tool to figuring out why your point cloud data doesn't look the way you're spo it's supposed to or you're imagining it to. Because we're in the virtual world, of course, it's perfect. We, we can clearly see all our boxes. And um, I'd like to point out something. It looks like there's no data in between here. And this is why grayscale is kind of bad. I want you to switch to color. And now you'll notice, oh, there's a lot of data everywhere. So all the blue stuff here is data. And because when we switch to color, we go from blue to red, rather than from grayscale, where we go from black to white. By the time it turns black, you can't tell there's data there because unfortunately here, black indicates very low data points as well as the absence of data. So if you go to color, you can see inside here there's a, there's a black line that just says there's no data there. All right, that um, brings me to this intensity. This is simply how bright your projector is. You have a scale from one to 13. And then the exposure time. This is not the exposure time for your 2D image. This exposure time is only for your 3D data acquisition. This does not affect your 2D image, only your 3D image. And um, as a result of that, you can go from 0.1 milliseconds to 30, and um, that's how long each camera looks at each striping pattern. Then the next thing is, you have your 3D map density. You can go from coarse to normal to fine. If we go to fine, you'll notice it'll bring up an error because we haven't allocated enough memory to do this. It'll let you keep it, but it won't work. So let's put this back to normal real quick, and um, we'll set up the map storage. By the way, the area sensor setup is now complete. Also, down here, you can see a couple of data points about what you just acquired, min, max values and you can see your points and how fast you actually acquired this. So it took us a second to acquire this. Um, we're gonna minimize this, minimize that. We're gonna pull up our teach pendant. And if you're doing this on the real robot, pay attention right now. What we do is go to next, menu next, status, memory, and then you click detail. Here you have to have 128 megabytes of DRAM. If you bought everything new and did this correctly, this should be in there because you have the high speed CPU with the 128 megs DRAM. By the way, when we serialized the robot, remember I t uh, set this to 128? This is what you need. If it says 64, you don't have enough. You need 128. So then we go to menu, IR vision, and then we go to vision config. And you'll get a line down here that's called 3D map storage area. And we want to select this. And in RoboGuide, this is a little bit buggy every now and then. You want to set this to 4. 
Notice how it says, please cycle power. This is a memory allocation, and to change memory allocations, you have to cycle power. So we're going to close our teach pendant real quick, and we're going to cycle power on our controller. And um, yeah, that brings us, I think that covers that guy. So next step is we're going to set up our 3D area sensor vision process. Now this is the bit that actually does the finding of parts. Um, and acqu acquires the 2D image, and this is where all your tools come into play and all this. So this is the complicated bit. So let's see, our robot restarted here. And, um, oh, there we go. What we want to do is we want to go back to, oh, disconnect it. We want to reopen this up and just uh, verify that everything worked out. If we go to area sensor, we select fine, no error pops up, and if you hit acquire, you get a very nice map and looks very crisp and clear. By the way, to show you the comparison, that's fine. That's normal. And then there's a course mode, which is just goes faster. See, it goes about, it almost goes twice as fast. We went from 800 milliseconds to 550. Oh, it goes, a, it goes a two thirds, as, it goes a third faster. And you can see it really starts to blur out because there's very few data points in here. For some parts, this may be adequate if you have very large parts in your bin. Um, a couple of data points on there are fine. And you don't need the fine mode. We're going to use fine mode because we can and because it looks nicer. All right, that's that. Now we go to create and we want to create a 3D area sensor vision process. We're going to call this, oh, we're going to call this demo. And we're going to say it's a blob because that's the tool we're going to be using. Let's open this up. And you should see an interface that looks somewhat familiar to you with a couple additions. Again, you have your vision tree up here. And it, notice how it by default spawns a couple of tools in here. We'll go to those in a minute. First thing you want to do is you want to select the area sensor that you just created. And you want to select your camera calibration. You'll note that you only get two camera calibrations even if you have 100 different camera calibrations on your robot. Because it only lets you choose the two camera calibrations that are associated with your sensor. That's what lets this whole thing combine 2D and 3D and all that stuff. So you want to select your camera calibration, and that brings an image in. And now if you hit 3D, 2D, 3D snap down here, that acquires a 3D map and a 2D image. Notice if we set this to 3D map, nothing happens. This is a common problem, so pay attention real quick. You have to go to your range section here, and you have to specify a range. It looks like it's grayed out. The check button is, but the fields are not. You have to put a range in there. Before you do that, though, you want to select your offset frame. We're going to do this relative to our user frame 1. And remember why I, s I said teach at the top of your bin. Now this becomes very helpful. So now I know my range is from minus 200 millimeters. My bin is 150 millimeters tall. Um, and we're going to go to 50 millimeters. And you get your image. So if you don't see your 3D image, check your range. Um, again, we can switch this to color. And you'll notice, by the way, that this is scaled relative to whatever your range is here. And if you set it too low, you can see you start cutting off data. So we're going to keep this at 50. That's all good. All right. And then the only thing down here is a couple of sorting parameters. We'll get back to those. And then your reference data. Notice that there is six instead of three, because we have x, y, z, roll, pitch, and yaw, instead of just x and y and rotation. Um, so let's get going with the area sensor preprocess tool. Now, this is critical. And every 3D vision process needs one of these. You cannot run this without it. If you don't want to use it, all you do is you disable all three filters, and you're done. It doesn't do anything. But you might as well, since we already have it. Um, bottom removal tool, exactly what it sounds like. Uh, we're going to do this in the 3D image real quick. So you can see we have data across the bottom of the bin here, and we don't really want that. We don't want to see it. 
we don't want to accidentally pick it. So we're, we know our bin's 150 millimeters deep. So we're going to go five millimeters above the bottom of the bin. And um, because we taught our user frame to the top corner, remember it's nice if you teach it to the top corner because now all the numbers are easy. We just say our bins, we want to move everything below 154 millimeters down. Enter. Find. Notice how everything turns red around here. So these data points are all discarded. We removed 42,000 um, data points. And um, now all we have left is our bin wall and the parts. Well, we don't want the bin wall either. So we have a container wall removal tool. We enable that guy. Our container Z, that is, it's asking for the top of the Z, uh, the top of the bin relative to the user frame. We taught our user frame to the top of the bin, so it's zero. Then that brings up the teach button. This is where you want to pay attention again, is you want to teach, you have a little crosshair in the middle, you want to put this ever so slightly inside your, the top of your bin. And you want to teach this right over here. Keep perspective in mind. So if you have different features on here, you want to keep your perspective in mind. Um, so once you move it to your corner, you hit OK. And it'll bring up the same window. Notice how the crosshairs are now down here. It automatically snaps to the first point you taught. So we're going to teach another point. Oh, don't show this message again. Um, we're going to keep this top point here. And we're going to see a line. Notice how it snaps back to the bottom. And we're going to teach our third point. Go there. Fourth point. Go there. And you can keep adding points as much as you want. I haven't hit a limit. I'm sure there is one, but I haven't hit one yet. All right. Now, if you try to click this down to here, you'll never close the loop. The only way you close the loop is by not moving the crosshairs or by hitting reset. Now it snaps back to the first spot and all you do is you hit OK and that closes your loop. Now we have four vertices which you can modify by selecting the vertex in here and then you can move, add, or delete. And um, what this does for you is actually quite nifty because we specified our Z height and we, so that we give it X here, uh, we give it Z here and we specify X and Y based on where we're clicking in our camera image. So now we've generated four points in space, and anything outside of those four points gets removed. Great, isn't it? So now all we should have left is the data that's from our parts. Very nice. We removed 77,000 um, data points. We still have 117,000 data points left to work with, so that's good. The last thing you want to do is your outlier removal. This is essentially a noise filter. Um, I'm not going to exactly explain the parameters. I can tell you you're going to be OK leaving them at default. If you want to mess with them, please read the manual. And now you can see there's a couple of extra data points in here that got removed because they're considered noise. It just makes your overall process a bit nicer. Save that. All right. For this one, we want to get rid of the peak tool. I'm not going to explain to you how the peak tool works. It's very simple. Um, please read the manual for that. But what we're going to do is we're going to go back to the area sensor vision process, hit new, and we want to select here, by the way, is all your 3D vision tools. And we want to select area sensor blob locator tool. Hit OK. Preprocess tool. See what I mean with every 3D vision tool has to have a preprocess tool? By the way, order matters. If I shift this down, this guy can't select it. Order matters. All right. Then you can assign model IDs to what, were found, what was found. Z height. This is a bit misleading. It's your connecting threshold in the Z height. The way this works is it'll look at a point and see if there's an adjacent point. If there is, they're connected. The only way that they can the two adjacent points will not be connected if it's their z height exceeds this value, uh, if their z height difference exceeds this value. So if you're jumping from this part down to this part over here, and that jump is bigger than whatever you're specifying here, it's not going to connect. Now, keep in mind that as we're on this one part over here that's tilted, we jump from one point to the next point adjacent, 
that might, depending on how high up your projectors, that might exceed the 2.5 millimeters. So if your points aren't connecting up an inclined surface, excuse me, you have to consider increasing your Z height. All right. The next thing is, real quick, we want to go down here to plot mode. And we want to plot found pause plus points, because that makes the image a bit nicer. And we hit find. Wow, found a lot. So that's, while this is an OK result, because we have a lot of things, it's not necessarily what we're looking for. Um, so a few things we can do. Normal, calcul normal direction. If we enable this, and just take my word for it, set this to 5 and set this to 20 for now, um, it'll compare normal vectors. And if they exceed the 20 degrees between another, that generates a cut. And if you select Find now, you can see that a couple of things got cleaned up, and there's several different new parts and all that stuff. And um, the next thing we want to do is we want to enable our contrast feature. Uh, we select our 2D, 2D image and edges. Don't have a whole lot of contrast going on. Because we're in RoboGuide, we can make this nice. We're going to set this to 1, and you can see a couple of edges show up. And if we say Find now, you can see that a couple of these got cut apart. All right, these are separation tools. They let you, because a blob can uh, go over certain features, you don't want it to go over necessarily. Um, you can use these, and if, I'm not going to explain them in detail. Please read the manual for this. Um, but you can use these to great effect to separate the blobs that you're finding into actual parts that you want to pick. So the next thing is we notice that our blob sizes are actually fairly big with a couple of small ones that we really don't want to go for. Um, because I've done this before, I'm going to say my blob size. The minimum blob size to be considered a valid part has to be 600. If we say find now, you can see all the little noisy stuff in the middle down there goes away. That's great. Now, um, actually, I think I had that at 3. Is that better? Nope. Yeah, it was five. Um, so the next thing we want to do is, because if you notice when you hit find, all you get is x, y, and z. That's not a 3D pose. I mean, that's a 3D position, but it's not a pose. So to do this, you have to hit calculate plane. Now, it'll t what this does, it'll take the blob you found and try to fit a plane to it. And now you can see a bunch of little magenta dots showing up. These are all planes that were not um, considered. Um, so what happens is we have the cyan points, and then we fit a plane to it, and any magenta point didn't fit the plane. So let's look for a nice one here real quick to highlight the, the point. So here we go, 26. See how all of this was one surface? And then it fit a plane to it. And the plane fits up here to this surface really well. But all of these points that are on the different side of the part don't fit. All right. So that's there. Um, of course, you can now add parameters here. You can add a conditional execution under here. You can look at different outputs. Something you might want to do, and I can show you this here real quick, is if you change your found position, I'm not going to cover all of these. There's a few. But if you set minimum rectangle, and you hit Find, you'll see there's a bunch of little lines show up. And what this does, it actually measures your part in 3D. So let's go to our part 26 here real quick, this guy. And you can see now, down here, there's a blob length and a blob width. Notice, notice our parts were 40 millimeters by 40 millimeters, so we're very close. And you can use these for your conditional execution. So if you're finding parts that are way bigger or way smaller than what you're expecting, um, you can eject them with a conditional execution tool. Also note that these are millimeters, not pixels or anything weird. They're millimeters. So this surface that is very tilted towards the camera will have the same measurement as a surface that is flat towards the camera because it's measuring 3D space. It's not measuring the 2D image. It's measuring the 3D data points. Pretty cool feature. All right, we're going to put this back to gravity center. Um, 
disable our angle calculation because we don't really care about rotation and leave it at this for now. Uh, so that brings us back to this and actually no, forgot one. You select the 3D area sensor blob locator tool, hit new and you want to select your measurement output tool. Because bin picking is special and all that, you have to specify your sorting parameters in the output tool. So measurement one, you select your blob locator tool and whichever parameter you want to sort by. I'm going to sort by my Z height because in bin picking it makes sense to pick the highest part first, not the lowest, not the best, just the highest. Of course, that is up to you. Some scenarios might require different sorting parameters and you can actually modify these on the fly. Um, that is advanced coding. I'm not going to cover this in this, but that's just something to be aware of. You can specify all 10 different measurements and then in the TP code select different measurements you want to sort with. Now, before we do the next step, I want to do one thing here real quick. I want to um, part one, edit offset. We're going to pull this guy up square here. All right. I know this is kind of cheating, but that's why we do this in a virtual world, because you can cheat here. All right, we're going to leave this floating in the world here. If you do this in the real world, you're not going to have such an easy time, but we're going to hit apply. And um, we're going to go back to our vision process. We're going to find one part. We're going to acquire a new map because we changed things. And we should see, here's our nice little part. If we hit find, this is the part we should find. Very nice. All right. Um, we found this. We set our reference position. Yeah, I assume this is the part you want to set your reference as. Yep. Hit OK. All set. That concludes your vision process. Now this bit is done. All right. Now we're going to leave this right here. And I think that concludes this bit of the section. Now comes interference avoidance. Interference avoidance is interesting. It is kind of difficult to wrap your head around for some people. And um, the more you can understand it, the better off you are and the more successful your system will be. If you leave your interference avoidance very conservative and don't try to figure out what you can and cannot do, you're going to eject a lot of picks based on interference. Whereas if you let your system work, and um, let the, the robot actually do what it can do, uh, you're going to have much bigger success. Um, so let's start with this. First things first, you're going to have three things. You have a robot set up. You have to teach the robot how it looks. You have a system set up, which is teaching the robot how everything else around it looks. And then you have a condition, which um, specifies how these two things can interact. All right. The way you do this on a real robot is you go to here, and you click Interference Avoidance Setup. You get a little screen like this. You can create a system, a robot, and a condition. We're going to start doing this differently, and we're going to do this in RoboGuide. So we're going to skip all this. So we're going to close this and bring up my RoboGuide. If you open up your robot controller, you get a Interference Avoidance thing right here. And um, this is the greatest development, and this is why we're using Revision J. The area sensor is supported in Revision I, but Revision J supports the visualization of interference avoidance. So what we're going to do, first thing first, is we're going to um, specify our robot. Because our robot actually has no idea how it looks. So we're going to do this, and we're going to add a tool object. We're going to add a sphere which this works similarly to DCS, except for you have a little bit more freedom of how you, s uh, of the kind of prisms you can use, and uh, of the kind of poly polyhedrons, polygons, polygons, that's what I'm looking for, you can use. So we're going to use a sphere, and don't worry about the type too much. And what we're going to do, and this is because I already set this up previously, this is going to be a radius 10 sphere. No, not a radius 10. That's a radius 70 sphere. There we go. And this is going to sit at minus 80. 
Now, all of these measurements are relative to the default location of the tool. So notice how I go minus 80 to go into the tool because Z is pointing out. And um, I put a sphere here. Some might argue that you would want to put a cylinder there because it's more efficient at covering the, the, the wrist without wasting stuff. But what will happen is when you rotate J6, the cylinder will rotate with it and now it won't match anymore. The only thing that can go here is a sphere, because when you rotate a sphere, it's still in the same spot as it was before you rotated it, or it'll cover the same area as before you rotated it. So the nice thing is you can see now it covers my entire wrist here. All right, that's that. We want to add the next one. We're going to add a cylinder. So what we want to add, what we want to cover now is our little J6 here. So we're going to say this is going to be a radius ooh, 40. There we go. And this is going to go from minus 3 to minus 25. So you can see we now have this J6 covered. That's good. Um, we're going to add the next cylinder. This is going to be to cover this little base down here. We're going to make this a 20. And this will go from minus 5 to 5. There we go. Very nice. And then we're going to add the next one. By the way, if you do this in RoboGuide, it is so much easier than doing this on the real robot. Because the real robot has no idea of where you're putting this. I mean, it has an idea, but you can't see. You don't see a representation. If you do this in RoboGuide, you can load the CAD of your tool, and you can make sure that your interference avoidance setup looks exactly the way you want it to. So I highly recommend you load your tool into RoboGuide, attach it to your robot, and do it this way. Because it'll be saving you a lot of headache and a lot of frustration. This one's going to be radius 10. See how we're covering that little stem now. And we're going to go to just about 150. Now notice how I'm not going to include the entire tool. That's just because I'm assuming that wherever this is going, if I interfere with something, it'll interfere with this part first. And if I, something's getting picked very close to the ground, I don't want to have my interference avoidance set up all the way to the top. Uh, to the front here because I might, the robot might think it's going to collide with the bottom of the bin and we don't want that. So there's that. We're going to add, I think I need one more. Yep, one more. And we're going to cover this little fitting that's sticking out the back here. So this is going to be a radius 5 at 0, 0, 39. And it's going to go to minus 25. See, now you can put these at angles. And also 39. There we go. Now we got our fitting covered. Nice and neat there. There we go. Looks good. All right. That does the tooling. Now you'll pro let's see here. Yeah, there's nothing here. Because. As far as I am aware, that, oh no, there it shows. There we go. So now, see this is how it looks if you set this up on a real robot. You get these little boxes, you can fill it in. But there's nothing to show you what you just set up. You just have to know that your numbers are right. That's why it's very nice to do this in RoboGuide, because I can see everything. All right, end that. Minimize that, and we're going to say here real quick, invisibility, just because they're annoying, take those away, invisible. They're still here, they're just invisible. The next thing we want to do is we want to teach our container. So this by default gives you a bin, and you can add stuff later, but by default it gives you a bin. You want to select your user frame. We're going to do this relative to user frame 1, because that's the one we have relative to our bin. And you get two bin IDs. These are global variables. I'm assuming you know what a global variable means. It, um, if you don't, it, uh, it means if I set up a bin 1, 
and I create a new system, and I select bin one, it'll pull in all those data values that I just set up. So this container, the values are tied to container ID, not to the system that you're setting up. Something to keep in mind. Um, so remember I said it's nice if you teach it to the corner of your bin because it makes your values nice? Well, where's our origin? Corner of the bin, zeros. X position, we're going to have this be 380. Whoops. There we go, 380, and then our Y position is 550. Depth value is invalid. So now I put my X position here, my Y position here, and I just haven't specified a depth. This, even though our depth is in minus Z, it is a positive number that you put in there. And you can see now there's some blue shading going on. It's because it's completely the same as my bin. Now that's great. We want to maybe add a little bit of buffer so we're going to put an XY margin of 5 in there. Now you can see that it shifted these walls, these virtual walls, in a little bit. And what it's going to do is going to keep the tooling we just defined away from this stuff. And then we can add a little bit of buffer from the bottom. And there we go. Now, this is why it's very nice when you teach your frame to the corner of the bin. If you can't do that, at least teach to the top of the bin because then you'll and in the orientation of your bin, because then you can make these numbers very easy for you. They're not terribly hard to put in. Um, if you do this on a real robot, you can do this two ways. You can, um, you can punch in the numbers by hand, or you can put a pointer on your robot, point it to the corner, and hit, there's going to be a record button. I'll show you that in a little bit, and you hit record. All right. that's concludes this bit. You can add parts to this. I'm going to add a hexahedron. And because this is nice and we're in RoboGuide, you can drag this thing around in RoboGuide. Isn't that cool? And you can just put it right where you want it to go. So let's assume, for argument's sake here real quick, that this structure was right next to the bin. So we don't want the robot to hit this. So we're going to specify a little box right around the structure that the robot's also not allowed to hit with the tooling that we defined. We're going to give it a little bit of buffer there just to be on the safe side. And you define a hexahedron with four points, by the way. Origin x, y, z. All right. Apply. Yes. And now this is defined. So the robot will not allow any of these things to hit any of the, any of the green things to hit any of the blue things. Great, isn't it? All right, let's make this invisible real quick, and we make this invisible real quick, and we make. Oh nope, that went invisible. All right. So now our interference avoidance is set up. So if we go back into here real quick, uh, close this out, and refresh this, our system showed up. See, this is how it looks when you set it up on a robot, and you see these set buttons. So if you jog your robot, and you have to be in the correct user frame and tool frame, of course. These are important here. The, the user frame of your, of your speci that you specify up here and the tool frame of your pointer, and then you can hit set, and it'll record those data points for you. The only thing you can't, you have to put in by hand is going to be your depth, because they assume you can't jog your robot all the way down. All right, and then here's that fixed object. That's the hexahedron. It has those four data points, base, depth, width, and height, or origin, x, y, z, whichever way you want to look at it. All right, the last thing, and this is probably the hardest thing for people to wrap their head around, is the condition. You go in here, and you hit condition, and we're going to call this our pick condition. Don't ask, just do. Type interference avoidance. Utool is the utool you will be using when you do your picking. We're going to be using utool one. Check mode, check until interference avoidance fails. Angle between z axis and pose. Now, this is why it's important to teach your frames correctly with your z of the tool frame pointing into the tool 
and the z of your user frame up and out of the bin. Because what this is referring to is the maximum angle that is allowed between the z-axis of your tool and the z-axis of your, your frame. Because if you, by accident, have your tool frame pointed at out of the, the z-axis out of the tool, there's always going to be, if you come straight down on the part, there's a 180 degree difference between those two axes, which is always going to exceed your 60 or whatever you have specified in here. Um, of course, you can put 180 in here. Nobody's stopping you. But the point of this is to prevent the robot from doing weird contortions into the bin. So 60 is the maximum angle of the tool inside the bin. And that'll keep most of the wrist out of the bin. It'll prevent your robot from running into stuff. Um, that's just something you should not put 180. Use your own judgment. If you feel like you need it, please go ahead. Um, the next thing is, and we're going to do this a little easy here. Let's see. We want our part one. Move two. Oh, come on. Did you really? Why are you not moving there? Yay for technical difficulties. All right, joint minus 90. Nope, not minus 90. 90. This one's minus 90. Let's just make this a bit easier on ourselves. All right, so this is the ideal pick position, right? But this is valid. Oh, I lost my little triad there. And this is valid. So is this. So is this. And yes, I know you want to pop up. If you have a suction cup, even though you're not exactly square with the part, you'll still, if you put push down hard enough, you can still make a seal with this. So tilt's OK, too. And does it really matter which way we rotate our tool? Nope. We can have this rotated as far as we want it to be. So this is what the condition does. The condition says, even though that is my ideal pick position, I am allowing you to shift along the tool frame. This is relative to the tool frame. Minus 10 millimeters, or 10 millimeters in the positive. Or we're going to shift in minus y, or positive y. Or we allow rotation around x, y, and z. Uh, depending on your suction cup, you can get away with 15 to 20 degrees rotation. And since our tool isn't rotationally constrained to our pick, we can allow a full 180 degrees rotation here. What this does, if the part's up against the wall, let's, oh, I don't have a good one here, do I? Oh, this one might be. So this guy, let's say he comes into pick and we would hit this wall here. It'll shift this pick position according to these conditions and see if it can find a pick position where the tool does not collide with the bin. Right? Easy. If you can figure, if you can understand that these conditions can be applied to the tool frame at the original pick position to shift this whole tool around just so it can not hit something solid and still pick the part. Now, these, will, these values will be different for every tool and every part you use. If you have a cylinder, for example, you probably won't allow it to shift in Y. And you probably won't allow it to rotate around Y either. And you won't allow R rotation. You're just going to shift along the length of the cylinder, and you may be shifting. You might be allowing to rotation around the length of the cylinder. That's a bit more advanced. We're going to leave it at this. That's why we did it this way for this, for this training. Um, hit save, 
and edit. That's your interference avoidance setup complete. I know that's a lot to take in, and I expect you to um, try this again when you are done watching this video. There we go. Let's put this back to our reference pick position. Because remember, this is the part we set our reference vision, a reference position to in vision. This is going to be a reference pick position. Because now comes the part list manager. We go to our robot homepage, part list manager. Um, by default, you'll see when you do this the first time, you'll see this image, and you can see there's a part list manager, and it says type is not set. So when you double click this the first time, it'll ask you, do you want to search plus find or just search? For bin picking, you want to use just search. The search plus find is used for bin picking with a 3DL. We're not going to do that, so we're just going to take the search. Now it says search over here, by the way. If you ever want to change it, you have that p-type. You can change it. And if you double click this, you'll see this. Um, this is your search list a search vision process list. Here you specify all of the vision processes you want to use for searching your bin. If you have 10 different vision processes, there is ways to increase the number here. By default, you're given two, but there are ways. And you can look that up in the manual. But we're going to specify our vision process, which is demo blob and priority. Remember that measurement output tool? We're going to use measurement one. All right, that trains this page. Save. We're going to go to page. Now there's five pages. Don't freak out. We're only going to do three of these. So we're going to go to pick position list. In here is where you specify your pick position. So we're going to use our vision process. This has to match because you can call uh, uh, you can call search item one, and then you can use pick position item two if you wanted to. They don't have to be one and one. You can, they get called separately. Um, you can do that whatever way you want, but your vision process here has to match the one you use to find the part, because this just generates the pick position. All right. Um, you can constrain model IDs. Uh, interference avoidance setup, you can disable interference avoidance if you don't want it. Or you ena enable it. Of course, you would want it unless you have a really, really shallow bin and you don't think you'll ever hit it. You specify your system. Notice it tells you which user frame you're in or it was set up in. You specify your robot setup and you specify your condition. And notice the condition tells you which tool frame it's relative to. And then because this calculates the pick position and the approach position. So you might want to have a little bit of an offset so your tool comes straight down onto the part. And you, can, you have to specify a condition for your approach, condition, for your approach position as well. Um, the way you calculate your approach position is by specifying either an offset or a tool offset in one of the PRs. I have mine in PR10, I do believe. Pick position offset. So we're going to, by the way, we're going to record this. Zero, zero. We're going to do this at 50 millimeters, zero, zero, zero. So that's my tool offset that's going to get applied to calculate my approach position. That's specified here. You can combine these if you want. I don't know why you would want to combine them. Or you can just use a standard offset. If you put in zero, it's not used. If you put anything else in there, it'll use that PR. Now comes your reference pick position. This works very much like it would if you do this with 2D. Namely, you find your part in the vision, hit set reference in the vision. You jog your robot to the part that you want to pick and how you want to pick it. Here you have to make sure that your coordinate, uh, your frames are set correctly. You want to be in tool one and user one, because that's what we're going to be picking in. And you hit set pick position. Done. Isn't that great? So notice up here it says user frame one, tool frame one, and your configuration. The only way you can change these is by setting your robot to a different frame 
and um, then hitting set pick position again. That's the only way you'll be able to change those. These values you can type in if you wanted to. Um, that's your pick position setup. We're going to hit save. And the last thing we're going to do is the status setup list. And we're only going to concern ourselves with the pick success for now, because this is the same for any other kind of um, setup. So pick success. If we succeed to pick the part, we want to delete the target part off the part list. Leave it at delete. That's the only thing you can do. But we might want to delete any parts that are really close by, because in the real world, we might have jumbled them. So we want to say, awaiting part data x, y, within, oh, we have 40 millimeter parts. We're going to say within 80 millimeters also get deleted. So that means if I pick part here, this part will be deleted because I might have moved it. Make sense? I hope so. If not, um, rewatch the video or read the manual. All right. And then we have pick IA fail. By the way, pick fail, you can set up parameters. I'm not going to explain the blacklist, because that's a lot more complicated than I want to get into in this video. And then we're going to say pick IA fail. And um, if we fail the interference avoidance, we're just going to delete the thing and call it good. Save that. That's your part list manager in a nutshell. Now that's done. All right. That concludes our part list manager, our vision processes, and all that good stuff. Yep. So the last thing we want to do. Oh, part list manager, yeah, search VP and pick position list. The macros. Bin picking isn't controlled through the run find commands and stuff like that. Like, um, you know how when you s create a program, you can go into here and you can say, vision, and then you can do a run find. That's not how bin picking works. Bin picking works through macros that call carol functions. So let's go here. So this is the carol function, IP clear. It uses argument one. And um, my argument one is, in this case, I'm clearing my part list. So we're going to go through the program here real quick in a rather linear fashion. Let's see, I forgot to open that up. So program, there we go. All right, let's bring all of this stuff back up. The program, and I apologize, this is going to be a bit much to throw at you. Try to follow. If you don't, don't worry about it. Clear the part list. Set our user frames, jog to home. Do the 3D snap. This is only 3D data acquisition. This doesn't do the 2D acquisition. Bin pick search. You specify which search list ID you want to use. Remember, we set up multiples. Oh, where did it go? Oh, I closed it. Part list manager. Specifies which one of these ones you want to use, one, two, or if you have more. Um, check if it was a success. Do some logic. Um, pop. So this pulls a part from the part list. Then the next thing we're going to do is get pick pause. This calculates the pick position, applying interference avoidance and all that. If that succeeded, now we can do a pick. We're going to have to insert some pick instructions here. Retreat, place the part, and start over. All right. So. We're going to try and do this real quick. Let's see. Um, we're going to make this our home position here. Data, home position, right coordinate frame, yep. Record. We don't need this one. Center over bin position. Just kind of center the robot over the bin. That prevents collisions and all this. So this is at, 
should be at one. What was it? Two fifty. So that's two seventy five. Uh, and uh, we're 380, so this is at 190. And remember, this is all relative to our user frame over here. So this makes these numbers very nice and easy. And we're going to say we're going to be 75 millimeters over the bin at no rotations. And that's done. The only other, these ones we don't near, need. Pick position. We're just going to record these just so the variables are initialized, prevents any errors later on. These get overwritten. These get overwritten by the IM get pick pause or the bin pick get pick pause macro. This is where your pick position gets stored and your approach position gets stored. And you just tell the robot to move to that PR. It gets changed every time you do it, and you don't have to do any offsetting, no nothing weird. It always goes to this point. It's an absolute point. Just go there. All right, so we're going to go back to our program here real quick. Um, by the way, if you go to menu 7, which is the files, and then you go to next and view, you go with a wide, you can see more on your teach pendant. So we're going to, we have our home position recorded, search list ID, we're going to also have to add here real quick, oh, enable the teach pendant. Number nine, which is our pick position ID, we're also going to set that to one. See here, call bin uh, bin pick acquire three D map. This is what I mean with you have to specify and you have to type out the sen the name of your sensor process. This acquires a three D map. I am uh, bin pick search does the searching. This runs your vision process. You specify which vision process, depending on what register 5 is, which we just set to 1. So we're going to use um, the first entry in the list. If we succeed, we keep going. If we don't, we do. See, you could just say then, I want to do search list ID 2, loop back to the top, and search again. I am pop. Pop pulls the part list out of the part, uh, part, the part from the part list, um, part list 1 that uh, just says where the status goes, and it'll save you what model ID is, the model ID is, because you can use the model ID then to decide which pick position you want to use if you wanted to. I am get pick pause is by far the most complicated one. You specify the part list, which pick position, we set it to one. You can use the model ID here to decide that if you wanted to. The status, PR1 is going to be our pick position, interference avoidance offset. And then the approach position. If we succeeded at all this, we're going to, if we fail, I am set stat. 122 means we call that condition, interference avoidance failed, we delete the part, we go to the next one. Succeed it at calculating a pick position, we go to center over the bin and see what I mean, we just move directly to that PR. That's it. In here, we're going to insert our gripping instructions in a second. Once we have that, we do an incremental retreat. Then all of, whoops, don't want to jump to items. Um, part presence. In the real world, you want to do your part presence check. Here, we don't have one, so we're just going to say there's a part present no matter what. Bin pick set stat. Um, this says if your part is present, we succeed it. So you say it's set stat 120. That calls that first entry item in the part list manager. And then if it failed, we do 21, which is pick failed. If we succeed it, we go to drop the part. So I'm going to do some few, a few things here real quick without much commentary. We're just going to apply that.
by the way, I'm assuming that everybody knows how to do these operations that I'm just performing here real quick. I'm just not doing commentary, so it goes a little bit quicker. That's our drop location. Um, we're going to go back to our teach pendant here real quick. We're going to do instructions. Nope, not an instruction. We're going to do a joint move to, oh, we're going to do a linear move here. And we're going to insert a line. Do a joint move at 25%. And this is actually going to be just a tad above this. All right, done. We're going to do a call here, and then we're going to drop the to drop the part. And then we do a quick retreat move, linear, continuous. Go back to point 0.2. Nope, not 22. There we go, point two. And um, yeah, so I'm going to do some simulation programs here real quick. I'm assuming that's also something that you know, but I am going to point out something. So simulation program, this is going to be our pick program. Apply. That just lets the robot attach stuff to its gripper. Pick up. We want to pick the box. Don't select any of the parts. Leave it at the star. What that does, it takes whatever part is closest to the tool and attaches that one. And we're going to attach it to the tool. That does the pick program for us. These are very simple. Simulation program. Drop. And we're going to call this. Uh, we're going to do a drop command to the box from the tool to fixture 2. Already done. Very nice. All right. Back to our, oh, I closed that, didn't I? Back to the teach pendant. Edit. Nope. Bin picking. There we go. And. Um, through all this logic to the actual few move commands that we have. So in here, instead of the pause, we're going to call program pick. That just tells the simulation program. You would put an I.O. statement there to pick up your part and maybe a wait statement. Do the retreat moves, check the part presence, go to our drop location call our drop program, increment up again, and we're done. So in theory, if we set up everything correctly, and I certainly hope I did and don't have to do any troubleshooting here, um, we will see this run quite nicely if I hit the Run button. Yes. There goes the tool to there. There comes the 3D snap. You can see it's a little bit laggy because it's simulating everything. But yeah, it goes to the part, picks it up. Look at that. All right, maybe I should set my center over the bin position a little higher up. So center over bin position, position. Uh, let's put you to 150. Right after that move is done, done. All right. Let's close that guy again. See? So now you've done bin picking. Congratulations. This, uh, this concludes this video. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. We're going to do this like this real quick so you can keep seeing it running. And close this guy out real quick. And just go to the last page. So here's my contact information. If you have any questions about this, please feel free to contact me and ask me about it. Um, I'll be happy to help. Uh, otherwise, good luck and have fun with the bin picking. Thank you very much.